brachial plexus injury. Will overhold. Anatomy. The brachial plexus is a bundle of five nerves that control the movements and sensations of the arms and hands. There is a brachial plexus for each side of the body. Anatomical sections, it is split into five. Spinal nerves, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. On the left graphic, you can see that the clavicle is directly above the brachial plexus and the brachial plexus connects to the spinal process. This graphic simply shows the five sections between the nerves, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches, uh, which specific nerve goes with which uh, branch and how it follows through the arm. There are four types of brachial plexus injuries. Avulsion, the nerve is torn away from the spinal cord attachment. Rupture, nerve is torn, but not from the spinal cord attachment. Neuroma, scar tissue is grown around the injury site, putting pressure on the nerves and preventing them from sending signals. And neuropraxia, the nerve is stretched and damaged, but not torn. On the right graphic, you can see what those nerves would look like if they were damaged. Uh, it shows examples of all four types of brachial plexus injuries. Pathology slash signs and symptoms. Less severe brachial plexus injuries can lead to a feeling of shock or burning sensation down your arm, which is where you'll typically hear the terminology of a sh uh, stinger or a burner. Loss of sensation or numbness and weakness or the inability to move your arm. A more severe brachial plexus injury can lead to weakness or inability to use certain muscles in the hand, arm, or shoulder, or lacking a complete range of motion in those three things. Uh, you will also see severe pain. And Herb's palsy is specifically for childbirth. Uh, the shoulder of the baby can be wedged in the birth canal, stretching the neck and the shoulder, uh, causing that pain. Uh, there are other factors involved in pregnancy, such as how long the pregnancy goes and the weight of the child. Pathology again, uh, this is showing the difference between an upper trunk palsy injury and a lower trunk palsy injury. On the left of these graphics, you will see how this injury can happen in uh, the activities of daily living for a normal person. Um, in the upper trunk, you'll see that the C5, C6, C7 have completely detached from the spinal cord um, and C8 has been lacerated. In the lower trunk, you can see quite the opposite. Uh, the C7, C8, and T1 have been detached and the C6 has been lacerated. Mechanism of injury, you can sustain a brachial plexus injury during birth, uh, playing any contact sport such as football, hockey, soccer, really any sport where you can take a direct blow to that brachial plexus. Uh, that is also where you'll see the terminology of burners and stingers. Uh, having inflammation or a tumor in close relation to the brachial plexus, that can put unwanted pressure on the brachial plexus, causing those nerves to not send those signals out uh, during trauma. Falling awkwardly, a gun or a knife wound, where you'll typically see lacerations of the nerve, complete uh, tears, a vehicle accident, or additional injuries. The brachial plexus, um, there are two different kinds in, that are shown. Uh, the bottom test is a more simplified version that you can do uh, just with your patient, uh, having them bend their neck um, to the side and bring out their arm in abduction. Um, not directly back or directly to the side, but in almost a 45 degree angle. What are shown next are four upper limb tension tests, or ULTT. Uh, this is ULTTA. On the median nerve, the anterior interosseous nerve, and the nerve roots of C5 to C7. To perform the test, depress the patient's shoulder, abduct the arm to 110 degrees, and flex the elbow to 90 degrees. Then laterally rotate your patient's shoulder, extend your patient's wrist and fingers, and slowly extend the elbow until symptoms are provoked. To confirm that you are stressing your patient's neurological structures, you can take off some tension by flexing the elbow a little, and then ask your patient to laterally flex his neck to the opposite direction, which should increase the tension again, and confirm your findings. Up next is the UL ULTTB. Trying to put stress on the median nerve, the axillary nerve, and the musculocutaneous nerve. The procedure of the ULTTB is basically the same like shown in the ULTTA, except that you now depress your patient's shoulder with your hip, and you abduct his arm to only 10 degrees, flex the elbow to 90 degrees, supinate the forearm, extend your patient's fingers and wrist, and slowly extend his elbow until symptoms are provoked. Again, to confirm your findings, 
you can create some slack by flexing the elbow and then ask your patient to laterally flex his neck in the opposite direction to create tension again. Up next, the ULTTC. TC is designed to put stress on the radial nerve. To perform the ULTTC, again, depress your patient's shoulder with your hip. Then bring the arm to 10 degrees of abduction and now flex the elbow to 90 degrees. Pronate the forearm, flex the fingers and then extend the elbow completely again until symptoms are provoked. Again, you can confirm your findings by asking your patient to flex his neck in the opposite direction. Finally, the ULTTD is designed to put stress on the ulnar nerve as well as the nerve roots C8 and T1. To perform the ULTTD, first depress your patient's shoulder, bring his arm to 90 degrees of abduction, pronate his forearm, extend his fingers and wrist, go into lateral rotation of the shoulder and then slowly bring his fingers towards his ear until symptoms are provoked. And again, you can aggravate this test by asking your patient to flex his neck into the opposite direction. Like I said before, you'll see a lot of similarities in all those four tests with the bottom picture that you'll see with the lateral bending of the neck. Predisposing factors. Most brachial plexus injuries happen due to certain mechanisms of injury and have no predisposing factors. The only one that I can think of would be that improper padding can, attribute, can contribute to injury if that area of the neck is not correctly covered in contact sports. Um, also regarding childbirth, the weight of the child can be a predisposing factor as well as a prolonged pregnancy. Management and treatment. The main thing to look at is the longer it takes for you to get that nerve checked out uh, and diagnosed, the longer it takes for that nerve to gain its full function again. Uh, so the quicker you get in, the quicker you heal. Uh, the time frames are dependent upon the specific injury, and most health professionals will examine all nerve groups to determine which nerves have been damaged, which you have seen in the four different special tests for the nerves. Management and treatment slash referral and immobilization. You'll see two different kinds of treatments for this. Uh, a non-surgical treatment uh, is kind of the route that a lot of people go. Uh, most brachial plexus injuries do not need surgery. They just need to be monitored. Uh, you'll typically see physical therapy come along with that. Um, if you're condition is bad enough, you will need a surgical treatment. Uh, this is only recommended if the nerves will not heal on their own or there isn't enough energy to keep their limbs, limbs moving. Surgery is not a guaranteed fix um, and there are other factors involved with the surgical treatment such as complications. You can still have nerve damage come out of this. Uh, the recovery is very long and candidates for surgery need to be very specific. Referral and immobilization. Uh, there are two procedures when it comes to surgery. Nerve repair, which is just a reattachment of the nerve to the spinal cord. Uh, this is usually used for an injury involving a knife wound or a gunshot wound. Uh, you can also go with a nerve graft, uh, which is just a replacement of damaged nerve from another nerve in the body. Um, it must fit specifically with that nerve. It will not be successful if it is not. Rehabilitation. Like I said before, the recovery process is very long. It takes the nerves a very long time to heal. Um, the rehabilitation focuses on arm, shoulder, wrist, and finger strength, as well as range of motion. Uh, this helps prevent the atrophy while the healing process takes place. Uh, pain can be managed with medication, physical therapy, and assistive devices. Prevention. There is no proper prevention to brachial plexus injuries other than using the appropriate padding in an athletic environment. It is important to be properly fitted before you take part in the high contact athletic event because this is about damaged nerves uh, rather than any other part of the body. Um, it simply takes time to heal and go through physical therapy. PCOT analysis. Population, 13 college football players. Intervention, 13 cases of brachial plexus injuries are being reported in college football athletes with 10 being documented with electromyography. Comparison, the comparison of how long it took to heal the nerves completely between all patients. The outcome, all but one patient healed between a 3 to 42 week span. This brachial plexus injury may also disguise itself as a nerve pinch and must be re-examined every two weeks if it, is, if it is not healed in time. Time is not very specific in this. Uh, it is a 3 to 42 week span to heal for almost all patients, but if the nerves are not healed, more time is necessary for the healing process and for the study, hence the two week um, 
extension if the, he, if the nerves are not healed. References.